Our first speaker's topic is genomics and primary care pediatrics, a complementary sequence. Dr. Francis S. Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health. He oversees the work of the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world, spanning the spectrum from basic to clinical research. Dr. Collins is a physician geneticist noted for his landmark discovery of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project, which culminated in 2003 with completion of a finished sequence of the Human DNA Instruction Book. He is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Sciences and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in November of 2007 and received the National Medal of Science in 2009. Please welcome Dr. Collins. Thank you and good morning to all of you. It's a great privilege to be part of this TED Med style plenary session at the AAP. And my clock just started running and I've got 18 minutes and I've got a lot I wanna say so I better just plunge right in. But I bring you greetings from NIH and from the many institutes at NIH that are involved in children's health research, particularly the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, but many other institutes as well that are deeply engaged in trying to push back the frontiers and learn new things that are gonna provide advantages for giving every child the chance uh, to live a healthy life. And I appreciate deeply what this society and all of you as pediatric professionals do in order to make those goals come true. So I was asked to talk about genomics, but I'm gonna be a little broader than that because NIH's broad uh, mission is in fact enough to cover almost anything. In 18 minutes, I had to pick very carefully a few things to touch on. Do recall, however, NIH has, as the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world, a job of supporting fundamental knowledge, that's basic science, but also the application of that knowledge to extend healthy life and reduce illness and disability. And the many investigators that we support, more than 300,000 of them across the country and some in other parts of the world, are dedicated to make that mission happen. I will say a word about the Genome Project, which after 13 years achieved its goals in 2003, ahead of schedule and happily, particularly for the Congress, under budget, and which over the last 12 years has stimulated a wide variety of other follow-up developments that I think have increasing direct application to pediatric practice. And yet we are still struggling a bit with a medical encounter trying to figure out how to make the most of this information in order to sort out a difficult medical situation. And in that regard, NIH has been funding a wide variety of follow-on projects to add information to the basic DNA sequence. And I might particularly point out those that are involved in epigenomics, the effort to understand how the environment interacts with the genome in order to influence gene expression and therefore the whole body's performance as well as such things as the microbiome, understanding that we're not just an organism, we're a superorganism, and the number of microbes that live on us and in us actually outnumber us and play rather crucial roles in health and disease in ways that we're just beginning to understand. But I would particularly point out the ways in which technology has made this happen. In 2001, the cost of sequencing a genome was roughly $100 million. Look at what's happened over the course of the last 14 years in this log scale, where we're down now essentially to $1,000, actually uh, roughly $1,363 by most recent estimates of a complete human genome sequence, which can be done in about two days. And this curve is gonna continue to drop. We haven't encountered any laws of physics yet that will prevent this from getting cheaper and cheaper. And that, of course, has implications in terms of discovering the causes of genetic illnesses, and you can see what's happened over the course of the last few years in terms of the ways in which that uncovering has been happening. Now in 2015, we know the cause of more than 5,500 disorders at the molecular level. Most of those are rare genetic disorders, but if it's in your family, it's not that rare, and you're hoping somebody will work on it. And one of the challenges we have is that of these 5,500 conditions, right now only about 500 of them have FDA-approved therapies. We have a big gap between what we can diagnose and what we need to learn about treatment, and that is a big focus right now at NIH with such efforts as our National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences and many other efforts as well. 
Of course, this still doesn't necessarily help you if you're faced uh, with a child who has a developmental disorder that doesn't fit any known diagnosis. And increasingly, I think people are looking for ways to bring genomics into that clinical encounter in a way that might provide answers. One thing we started doing a few years ago at the NIH Clinical <laughs> Center was the Undiagnosed Diseases Program bringing patients of all ages with long-standing undiagnosed medical conditions uh, to be evaluated by a team of about 30 different professionals led by Bill Gall, a pediatrician on our staff. And they have now, after almost 1,000 cases, determined a diagnosis in about a quarter of those and actually defined about 20 new diseases that were not previously known. Uh, given the importance of this and the opportunity here to extend this, we have now moved from a single center at NIH's clinical center to a network across the country. You can see the particular institutions now that are funded by NIH as part of this undiagnosed diseases network. This might be something you'd want to tap into if you encounter one of those puzzling situations where you have a suspicion that there may be something that could be understood on the basis of complete genome analysis, and you're looking to find out where are the centers that could do that. Well, here is this network just now getting underway. Well, let me turn, though, to a broader approach where genomics is potentially going to lead us in the direction of both diagnostics and therapeutics at an accelerated pace. And this comes out of a strong sense on the part of the President of the United States that the time is right to do something called precision medicine. And the precision medicine initiative that he announced on the State of the Union on January 20th has given, I think, a lot of momentum behind the idea of combining genomics, environmental exposures, electronic health records, wearable sensors, and a whole host of other things to try to really understand what are the causes and the ability to prevent disease, and how do you manage chronic illness when it happens more effectively than we currently do. This brings together, then, an increasing interest on the part of patients and parents uh, to take part in research electronic health records, which are now increasingly available and, while admittedly clunky in many ways, are in fact usable for certain types of research and getting increasingly so. The development of technologies that allow real-time measurement of what's happening to an individual at home or in the community, all the wearable sensors that are emerging in great uh, profusion and which potentially give us windows uh, into what's happening that we didn't have before. And of course, genomics, the many varieties of that, DNA sequencing, epigenomics, and I would add other omics in here as well in terms of metabolomics, proteomics, ways that you can systematically see what's happening in the body in various tissues. All of this gives us a big data problem, but a big data opportunity, and the field of data science is emerging in biology and medicine as one of the leading areas where we need to make investments and we need to recruit talent, and we're doing that as fast as we can. The first part of the Precision Medicine Initiative is focused on cancer because we are, after all, at a particularly exciting juncture for cancer. We know that cancer comes about because of mistakes in DNA, and if we can, in an individual tumor, diagnose exactly what's going on inside those cancer cells on the basis of a genomic analysis, then we're in the best possible position to identify the right therapeutics for that individual. The idea is to go beyond one size fits all to something individualized, and hence the word precision medicine, trying to be precise about diagnostics and therapeutics. Initially, this effort is going to focus on trials that allow thousands of individuals to have that kind of analysis of their cancers and then to have that connected up with a choice, an increasingly long list of targeted therapeutics to try to improve potential outcome. The initial match trial for adults is already underway, but a pediatric match trial is scheduled to start in 2016 for kids who have the kinds of cancers that we don't currently treat effectively, particularly sarcomas. More than 20 companies have agreed to make their targeted drugs available for these multi-arm trials, and that's almost unprecedented. Generally, companies are happy to have their drug tr tested just in one trial by itself and not in necessarily a head-to-head -head competition with others. But this is the way we're really going to get answers, and my hat is off to those companies for agreeing to do so. This will include immunotherapy strategies as well, which is such an exciting set of developments right now, particularly for childhood leukemias and lymphomas. And especially, this will allow an opportunity to go beyond monotherapy uh, for resistant cancers uh, to combinations. And I think if we're really serious about getting beyond remissions to cures, 
the evidence would suggest you have to have more than one drug, otherwise invariably there's a resistant clone of cells that's going to emerge and result in a relapse. And yet this has not been something we've had the power to do and this precision medicine initiative aims to speed up that process. As well, we need to understand when drug resistance happens, why did it happen, so we can learn from that and use that information in the future. That's the oncology part. The other part of the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is perhaps even bolder, and you can read about this at a website that I'm showing the URL for at the bottom of the slide, we aim here to enroll one million or more Americans in a cohort of unprecedented size and complexity to follow them over a course of many years or perhaps many decades, collecting as much information as we can with these individuals as full participants in the process. They're not patients, they're participants, they're partners. The idea here is to represent the rich diversity of the US and I might say all life stages, so that includes children, health status, race, ethnicity, and regional location, urban, rural, and try uh, very much to uh, encourage people to participate in this as a means of learning something on a national scale about health and disease. Volunteers would agree to provide their health data from electronic health records, to provide biospecimens, to answer questionnaires, and to try out the various wearable sensors. They would get information back on themselves, but they would also be asked in an altruistic way to take part in an effort that is going to help the whole nation, maybe the whole world, in understanding the factors involved in health and disease. So this will be longitudinal. The two methods in the next 12 months will include an opportunity for direct volunteers to sign up. I hope many of you in this room would think that would be kind of a cool thing to do. So when the moment arises, I hope you'll think about joining. But then we also aim to try to take advantage of some of the health provider organizations that are already in the process of setting up cohorts, some of whom have had those cohorts in place now for three or four years. If we can bring those together, together with the data that's already been collected, uh, we can in fact move this along more swiftly. The Million Veteran Program of the Veterans Administration is a possible candidate to join the effort, and we particularly want to reach out to those underrepresented so that we can learn more about social determinants of health, and the federally qualified health centers that are funded by HRSA seem to be an attractive opportunity to achieve that. So this is bold and unprecedented, but it, the time is right given the coalescence of all of these events. Possible uses of this, you could make up your own, and I suspect we haven't even thought about all of the things that you could do with this if you had it today. But one would be basically to test the idea of pharmacogenomics in the real world. Does it in fact help you to know the genotype when you write a prescription so that you're sure you're picking the right dose of the right drug for, drug for that person? Right now we have a lot of scientific data to say that would be useful, but it has not been tested in the real world. If you have a million people whose genotypes, in fact, complete genome sequences, are already in the medical record, there's no logistical barrier to using that information and trying to optimize outcomes. We will probably reclassify some disease categories, maybe particularly in the mental health arena. We will provide unbiased quantitative determination of disease risk by having biomarkers that can be followed over time to see what actually happens. We'll be able to see what's not only the cause of disease, but what are the causes of resilience. People who you thought should have been ill based on their environmental or genetic exposures, but are not. How are they managing that and how could we use that to discover new therapies? And this will be a powerful test bed for incorporating patient reported outcomes, the utility of electronic health records. Uh, all these mHealth uh, cell phone based applications can be tested out to see whether they actually improve outcomes in this real world setting and having a really good window into the consequence of environmental and social exposures. This will be heavily focused on engagement, participants, as I say, not patients, will be at the table, already have been in the design of this effort, and these will be centrally coordinated. The consent process will allow participants to be recontacted for other studies, and they will very much be engaged in this in an ongoing way. We'll use a single IRB, and individuals will have a chance to set the preferences, the kind of information they want to receive back about themselves. I want to move, though, quickly to another program, which is in many ways synergistic and complementary to this, which some of you may have been hearing about, but which had its major announcement actually just a few days ago. And this is ECHO, the Environmental Influences on Child, Child Health Outcomes, a program which is in place now following after the National Children's Study and using the dollars that would have gone for that program 
but in many ways, I think, designed to get the kinds of answers that we need most importantly here about the longitudinal impact of pre-, peri-, and postnatal environmental exposures on pediatric development and health. This will have focused areas on upper and lower, lower airway disease, particularly asthma, on obesity, on pre-, peri-, and postnatal outcomes, and on neurodevelopment. And you can see the core elements that will be collected from all participants. And we estimate tens of thousands of individuals in cohorts, many of which are already underway, will be included in this comprehensive study. Another area that we think will be very exciting to explore with funding from ECHO is to try to bring into the pediatric clinical research arena those centers that are located outside of the states that already have strong research universities and which are already therefore linked up more easily. And so we're creating an idea states pediatric clinical trials network. You can see the states that are involved in that and this will make it possible for many more children and their pediatricians to be involved in research than has traditionally been the case in those states. But finally, let me move before I'm asked to uh, close out my 18 minutes here to say a couple of things about the brain because I do think this is one of the most exciting things that's happening right now in research. The brain with its 86 billion neurons in the adult has been considered by many people the ultimate frontier. Some people have argued that our brains aren't complicated enough to understand our brains. I hope that's not true. But we are aiming really to tackle this with a variety of new technologies, like the one you see here. And this is a diffusion tensor MRI scan of a perfectly healthy uh, individual uh, obtained by looking at the passage of water through various tracts in the brain in a, a particular version of an MRI. Absolutely beautiful picture and one that shows you the elegance of the wiring scheme of the brain with all of these right angles that are so carefully arranged in the course of development. And of course, you'd want to know, how does this differ between individuals? The Human Connectome Project, which has been underway now for three years and which is close to being done with its initial 1,400 individuals aged 21 to 35, has in fact produced these images. They're all publicly accessible. Anybody who has a good idea about how to make the most of this data can do so. It includes twins, which is sort of fascinating to see whether the maps are similar. And they are a little bit more similar amongst monozygotic twins. Already there's a publication, and this is a write-up about it in my blog, and by the way, if you're not reading my blog on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you might want to because I'm sure you'd find it fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> this particular blog reports on a paper that looked at the connectome and was able to show a correlation in some of the wiring diagrams between people who have certain socially positive measures on various tests. Fascinating and making you wonder, oh, wait a minute, what's cause and what's effect? Uh, my bet would be that this is a lot more effect than cause. The brain is, after all, modeled by experience. You can imagine immediately how this may tie into things that pediatricians care about a lot in terms of what's happening in childhood experiences and the whole concept of toxic stress and how is that, in fact, affecting the wiring of the brain. And we maybe are beginning to get a sense of this. And just to be sure that we have a better sense at looking at an earlier stage, NIH will be funding by next summer a developmental human connectome project that will look in one project at ages 5 to 21 at another birth to age 5. And there's a whole U.S. brain initiative focused on developing better technologies to do even more interesting things and in understanding how the brain circuits work in real time. We also are interested in knowing what happens in that critical phase of adolescence and just recently announced by the institutes you see here, the ABCD project on adolescent brain cognitive development, studying 10,000 kids age 20, uh, 10 to 20 to study particularly what happens in terms of exposures uh, to drugs and by mental illness. Well, the only problem with all of this wonderful plans for science is what you see here. And I just want to finish by a brief comment about the circumstances that make this, in many ways, a very paradoxical time. Science has never been full of more potential, and that's particularly to, I think, of childhood diseases. But also, if you look at the yellow bars, which are the purchasing power for medical research at NIH, which have been eaten away by inflation pretty much since 2003 and now stand at about 25 percent below where we were 12 years ago, that is making it a very stressful time for investigators. We are doing everything we can at NIH to try to come up with creative ways to keep the engine of discovery going in the face of this, but it is not an easy time. And certainly, the comments from the Congress over the last year, reflected by what you see there in the House and the Senate marks for FY16, are very encouraging, but we don't have an FY16 budget. 
In that regard, I know Cokie Roberts came and spoke to you about this whole issue about how to interact effectively with the Congress, and you could not ask for a better person than Cokie to talk to you about that. But one voice is good. Most importantly, though, if we can all get together and talk about the value of medical research, the ways in which this changes lives, those seven things that were just shown to you on that remarkable video, all coming out of research experience, we need not to be shy uh, to make the case that now is the time to accelerate the pace and save more lives and give more children a chance uh, to live a long and happy life uh, without being struck down by chronic illness or other preventable diseases. So thank you very much for your attention. It was delightful to be here with you.